On this episode, you guys have decided what I'm gonna watch. I did a uh, question a little while back on YouTube asking people what they wanted to see on a future timeline, and it seemed as if uh, the one that got the most votes was the VHS movies. Whenever I'm doing an anthology, it's kind of a little bit trickier because I try to figure out the time frame of each section, which, you know, is a little bit, is a little bit tougher, but, uh, you know, we'll see if this holds up better than Betamax did. We start off back in 2012 with VHS, and I just, I just realized I have no idea what VHS stands for. Oh, um, video home system. I, I would say that it feels mixed up and home video system sounds better, but then we have HVS, which I don't, I don't know, to, to me it sounds like a, like a venereal disease. It was co-produced by Bloody Disgusting, the horror website, and is a found footage anthology film. So I'm, I'm already under the gun here, since we gotta try and figure out when each segment takes place. Uh, we start with the wraparound called Tape 56, directed by Adam Wingard of Your Next Fame, and we see a gang of thugs filming themselves committing crimes in the middle of winter. And they're offered a lot of money to break into a house to steal a VHS tape. And they found a dead man there and begin to play the tapes that are left. The first one is called Amateur Night, directed by David Bruckner, currently working on a new Hellraiser film. And we have a group of three friends with secret camera glasses on the hunt to find a woman to bring back to their hotel to film an amateur porn. They encounter an odd, quiet girl. And as they leave, there's a poster up on the wall. And it's just a quick flash, but it's an advertisement for the Atlanta zombie apocalypse. And that flyer's from a haunted house in 2011. And so that's our date, and we're around October or so. They all go back to the room where Lily suddenly transforms and starts tearing people apart, leaving only Clint alive. He gets away, but she catches up to him, and her face freaking splits in two. Like, what the hell is this, right? He spurns her, so apparently uh, she grows wings and carries him off, dropping the glasses and ending the segment. Meanwhile, in the framing, they find more tapes and a naked man in the house, and they pop in the next tape. This one's called Second Honeymoon, direct directed by Ty West of House of the Devil fame, and we have a married couple on their honeymoon, headed to the Grand Canyon with Joe Swanberg as Sam, and a mysterious woman knocks on their door, and someone enters their room at night. They visit the canyon on the following night, the intruder returns to kill Sam and is revealed to be Stephanie's lover. This one doesn't have a date, so we'll figure that it takes place in 2011 as well. Meanwhile, in Rapland, the guy's body is gone, and we go on to the next tale. Tuesday the 17th, from Glenn McQuaid, who had done I Sell the Dead, and a group of kids, including Poultrygeist's Arby, head out to a cabin weekend, and soon a glitchy killer is bumping them off. It seems Wendy was the sole survivor of a previous massacre, and brought these guys up for bait to draw out the killer, who can only be seen through the camera but he catches her and kills her, and she, I guess, becomes the glitch? No date again here, so that's in 2011 as well. And, and yeah, out of a collection of pretty decent shorts, this one, this one sticks out as the clunker. The next tape, called The Sick Thing That Happened to Emily When She Was Younger, was directed by Joe Swanberg, Sam, from the Honeymoon segment, and several cool movies, including Drinking Buddies. This one takes place over a Zoom, or sorry, probably Skype, the formerly household name for video chat that is now just a memory. It's a couple that are long distance and chatting, and she's hearing weird noises at night, and there's what appears to be a kid in her place. She has something unusual in her arm, but here's where it gets weird. It turns out that James is just in the next room, and it's revealed that she's being used as an alien incubator and he handles other women in the same role. No date again here since it's all basically in one room, so 2011 it is. But here's a question. How did a Skype call end up on a VHS tape? Back in the house, the dead guy is awake and decapitated one of the gang, and the last tape plays itself. It's 10.31.98, and oh, thank you for having a date right on the screen. It is very much appreciated. 
This one's by Radio Silence, who just did the new Scream movie, and a couple of guys go to a Halloween party, and one of them is dressed as a nanny cam, complete with built-in camera. But they've gone to the wrong house and end up interrupting some sort of ritual in which they rescue a girl, causing all sorts of weird stuff to happen, but it turns out the girl is the evil, and the boys are stuck in their car on train tracks and are killed. It should be noted that there is an alternate ending in which it turns out that they get out of the car, but I guess it's up to you to decide if you want that to be canon or not. That was extremely successful, so a sequel was rushed into production, and a mere one year later came 2013's VHS 2, with a mostly new team of directors creating the shorts. The Rap has a private investigator hired to find a missing college student, and it's directed by Simon Barrett, who's normally the writer associated with Adam Wingard, and is called Tape 49, an earlier tape from 56 in the first film. So are the tapes a countdown? They go to the kid's house where they find the group from the first film's footage, so we're set after that one. It seems Kyle here also collected the weird tape, and the associate begins watching them. The first is called Phase 1 Clinical Trials and is again directed by Adam Wingard, the only returning director, and has a man with an eye transplant that contains a camera. The doctor has a calendar up on his wall that appears to say 2012, and judging from the slashes, it appears as if we're set in June, so the wraparound would be set later than that, and, and he starts seeing things around his house, and here's the weird part. Herman's watch says that the date is June 10th, 2015. It even says it's a Wednesday, which is how that lined up in 2015. So this segment is in the future from when the film was released, which I guess makes sense since they have an eyeball camera. It then jumps two days to Friday the 12th and he meets a girl who can hear ghosts with an ear implant, but things escalate and she's killed. So he tries to cut the implant out, but is killed anyway. So, keep in mind, this is a digital recording from an eyeball that was shoved down a man's mouth, so clearly the tapes are supernatural, as there's no way that footage should have been on a VHS. The wraparound tells us that the tapes must be watched in a specific sequence, and we move on to the next one, called A Ride in the Park, and directed by Eduardo Sanchez of Blair Witch fame. We have a bike rider with GoPros mounted to his helmet, and he encounters zombies and is bitten, eventually becoming one and attacking others, ending up at a kid's birthday party. He's shot by a guy who brought a shotgun uh, to, to a little kid's birthday party. I mean, I, I, I guess it, there did end up being a zombie apocalypse, so I guess it was a good decision and butt dials his lady friend, and the sound of her voice triggers his memory, and he kills himself. This segment has no date though, so we'll go with Real Time 2013. The third section, Safe Haven, is by Timo Tijanto and Gareth Evans of The Raid fame, and we have a small film crew in Indonesia, and they're filming a cult that apparently worships the Blair Witch, and there's a whole commune, and the father there suddenly announces that it's time and they start attacking, killing and committing suicide en masse, leaving only Adam and Lena, and things start to get supernatural with Lionel Richie up here, and exploding Papa, and Lena gives birth to a horned demon, and, and then there's zombies, evil kids, and a car wreck as the creature sees his daddy, and big dangly boogers. This one has a little bit of everything except, uh, a date, that is. Let's roll with earlier in 2013, then, I, I suppose. The wraparound has Aisha having committed suicide and one last tape to watch. This one is Slumber Party Alien Abduction by Jason Eisner, who blessed us with Hobo with a Shotgun, and we have a couple of kids who strap a camera to their dog and terrorize their sister, and there's this loud sound and light outside. I, I mean, the sound is loud, not the sound and light. The, the, there is a there is a loud sound, and also a light. You know what I mean. Soon, gray-looking aliens are taking people away, leaving only young Randy, but eventually pulling him up into the air, dropping the dog onto the ground below. Again, no date, so real-time 2012. The rap ends with Kyle shooting himself right before the duo arrives at the house, and Aisha exorcist walks, and Larry is strangled. So, 
Given the nature of the framework, I'm placing most of the segments as having taken place earlier in 2013, with the wraparound taking place near the ending of the same year, with phase one taking place in the future of 2015, with the signal showing up on the tape back in 2013, because we have to accept that there's supernatural elements in place, that this movie has a GoPro video, eye cameras, and spy cameras all showing up on VHS tapes, so it's not too far of a stretch to say that there's a mystical element to the videos. Part two was even bigger than the first, and arguably better even, so a third entry went into the production, and just one year later, we got 2014's VHS Viral, with yet another set of filmmakers. The wraparound here is called Vicious Circles and is by Marcel Sarmiento, notorious for the film Dead Girl, and Kevin and his girlfriend Iris, And as he becomes more and more obsessed with filming things. And there's, there's a license plate with a sticker that expires in 2013. So that's probably when we're set, like later in the year after the last one, and Iris becomes entranced. We then jump into our first short with Dante the Great by Greg Bishop, director of the silly Dance of the Dead, and we meet Dante, an amateur magician who's found Harry Houdini's cloak that's actually magical, making him the biggest name going. And a security cam tells us it's July 26 in this shot, but, but not the year. And it turns out that he needs to feed the thing. Oddly, this missing poster is from January, so I guess some time passes, and his assistants go missing. And then more security feeds are dated March 4th, and it's said that Dante became famous over the course of two years, so it's likely that the other shots were from earlier in his career, and the March date is the most current, although we don't know the year. And Scarlet is his new mark, and Dante kills her jerky ex. He's arrested and seeks revenge, and the movie breaks its found footage rule, as I'm not sure who's supposed to be filming this stuff. He kills a whole SWAT team, but apparently the cloak likes her more and eats him. So she burns it, and, and again, who is filming this? It comes back though, and without a year, I'm placing this in real time March 2014. Back in the wrap, more and more people are being affected by the phone signal, and then our next one is Parallel Monsters by Nacho Vigalondo of The Amazing Time Crimes, and it gives us the date, thank goodness, and it's August of 2013 here. And Alfonso opens a doorway to a parallel world, and he and his double swap places. Everything is reversed there, and his double is apparently a swinger, and has occult things around his house, and there's a weird airship in the sky. Seems the people there have glowing faces and, um, monster penises. Uh, his wife has something I'm pretty sure I can't put on YouTube, and his double attacks his wife, but demon wife kills demon husband, and he closes the gate. Too bad Marta then thinks that her husband has demon junk and, and kills him. I'm going to come back to this segment in a few minutes, but for now, we go to Bone Storm from Benson and Moorhead of Resolution and Endless Fame, and a couple of skaters filming themselves, and a license plate sticker that expires in 2014, which means that either this segment is in the future as compared to the wraparound, or it takes place shortly before, and this person has their registration renewed for an earlier point. Like, like it's June here, and this guy had a license that expired in May of 13, so they renewed, but... The, the wraparound is in October or something, and that car expires in November or December of 13. They kind of act like dicks and then head to TJ, and this sign confirms that this section is in 2013. And they find a big pentagram and, whoops, bleed on it, so of course a bunch of spooky show up and start killing them. They fight back, eventually killing them all, even when they return as skeletons, and a massive creature is caught up and eats the cameraman. Meanwhile, Kevin finds the ambulance that he thinks stole Iris, and the tapes are in there, and she asks him to upload them to the internet, which he does, but she's already dead, and the videos are now out in the world. So, quick side note that there's been several apocalyptic events in this universe. There's a demon set loose in the first one, and again in the second one, and a zombie apocalypse, and now another massive creature is set loose. Just, just lots of things that should affect the universe or society in general that no one in the other segments ever mentions. But Parallel Monsters gives us the answers to everything. This world has alternate universes in which demons are overrunning society and changing things. 
The tapes are probably transmissions from various other realities seeping into our own, which is how they can be from various recording equipment and yet end up on tapes. I also want to point out that there's another segment to this movie that was cut out, but they put it back onto the DVD release called Gorgeous Vortex. It was directed by Todd Lincoln, who had previously directed The Apparition, and it didn't make it to the movie because they, they, they didn't feel like it fit, it's not found footage at all, and is a mostly surreal and stream of consciousness piece with no dialogue. It gets a little interesting here as the franchise was shelved for a while, but the amateur night segment from the first movie was so popular that it got its own feature length spinoff in 2016 called Siren. Directed by Greg Bishop, who did the Dante the Great bit of part three, and opens with the remains of a summoning spell in which the called creature broke free. It's a young girl, and then we jump to a bachelor party for Chase Masterson here, and they get tipped off to a secret underground party. And they meet Mr. Nix, who sets Jonah up with a show from Lily, again played by Hannah Fireman. And after realizing that she's trapped there, they set her loose. She attacks and does her whole, um, I, I guess I'll say dismembering thing, if you know what I'm saying, and she has a tail. The boys get chased by Lily and the security team, and she reveals her true face again and busts out those wings. She assaults Jonah, um, with her tail, like, oh, like all of a sudden I'm watching some hentai flick, and, and yeah, I was not expecting to see that, but... Uh, but then there's also this lady who has leeches in her head that can extract memories. They have a showdown where Nyx tries to get Jonah to reshackle Lily, and we're told that Lily is a succubus from hell, and that she mates for life, which is interesting because Bruckner said in interviews that although the character started that way, they went away from it, and he thought of her as a new distinct creature. Lily kills Nyx, and Jonah gets back home, and the marriage goes forward as planned, and it's their anniversary, so it's a year later. Turns out that Lily's back, and to save his wife, Jonah volunteers to go with her, and they fly off together. Now, there's no visible date here, so we can go with Real Time 16 if we want, but there's the question of if this is the same universe as the original VHS. So there's, like, there's few, three ways to go here if that segment is actually in 2011, although it is possible that the poster in that movie was, was old. That's, that's one option. That segment takes place after this movie. So after this, something happens to Jonah, like, like they don't work out and Lily kills him. So she goes back on the hunt, eventually ending up at Clint's hotel room. And that, that's an old poster. And this takes place, and that, that takes place in 16 or... Or since there's no date in this one, Siren takes place in 2010 with the end in 2011, and she kills Jonah and ends up out in the world later that year. Or option two is that this is in 2016, and VHS is in 2011, and Amateur Night is an instance in which Lily escaped Mr. Nix's captivity for a while, but was eventually recaptured after making a scene. And option three is that this is a completely different character in a separate continuity than the VHS universe. In 2018, the series sort of came back, but only on Snapchat in a series of four episodes that were available to view on your phone, and were only a few minutes each. They don't really seem overly connected to the overarching theme of the movies, and, and I couldn't even find a way to watch them, because they won't let me on Snapchat saying something about me being an, an, old, an old grandpa or something. Then in 2021, the franchise was reanimated with VHS, 94, with some new contributors and some returning faces. The rap is by Jennifer Reeder, mostly known for shorts, features a SWAT team on a drug raid, and they find a bunch of dead people who had been watching the tapes. And we enter our first segment called Storm Drain, and directed by Chloe Okuno, who had also previously just done short films. And they talk about the creation of the internet, and it, and it seems to be set in 94, much like the film's title. There's a mysterious thing people keep seeing in the sewers, a cryptid called the Rat Man, and a reporter investigates, and they encounter someone down there and are caught and held captive. The Rat Man appears, killing the cameraman, and there's a quick commercial here that is directed by Steve Kostansky. Yes, Psycho Goreman's Steve Kostansky, who just shows up here to direct this Veggie Masher commercial. 
Holly returns from the sewers, but pukes on her co-worker, killing him, now a disciple of Ratma. The second segment is The Empty Wake, again from Simon Barrett returning here, and Haley is working at a funeral home at a wake, requested to be recorded by the family, but no one shows up. Everything is filmed on videotape, again hinting at a 94 setting, along with an old school cordless phone. And she hears something inside the casket, and something breaks out. And Haley has to escape the headless corpse while the storm rages outside, in until she leaves, possibly a zombie, possibly just stunned, or possibly taken over by the spirit within Andrew. The next segment is again directed by Timo of Safe Haven fame, and it has an Indonesian doctor who says it's 94, so it seems all of our segments actually will be in that time frame. And he's conducting experiments, turning a girl into a cyborg, implanting a camera in her. He's raided in October, and they kill him, which activates a failsafe, and another cyborg awakes to kill. And SA tries to escape, fighting through the soldiers, eventually killing Subject 98, as her battery dies, but somehow she's alive and walks out. The next section is from newcomer Ryan Prowse called Terror, with a militia group planning a terror attack on a government building in order to reclaim America from people they call mongrels. They talk about Desert Storm, again reinforcing the 94 setting, and they have a guy in captivity that they keep executing several times as he's a vampire and apparently his blood can be used as a bomb in sunlight. But he manages to get loose, making short work of them, and then exposing himself to sun, exploding and destroying their camp. Back in the wraparound, most of the SWAT team are dead, and one of their members supply the militia group with their guns, and others are part of the cult, distributing the evil tapes, and they kill the guy, closing out the film. So nothing about the tapes is really unearthed here, except for the fact that they existed all the way back to 94, Although it's possible that this one is simply an alternate parallel world to the original, and the tapes have infected another reality. So there you have it, five movies uh, and a whole bunch of different shorts that, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's kind of hard to say that they have a continuity. I'd say the, the main wraparound storyline does have a distinct continuity. Uh, of it um, and an overarching storyline it does seem to be there but the segments themselves don't necessarily have a continuity and they're not really supposed to they're, they're just supposed to be instances from other worlds that are trapped uh, that are terrible events for us to see to to cause chaos and and uh, disrupt the flow of society or or whatever, I don't really know. Um, if you know, uh, put it down in the comments. Let me know what you think that the overarching theme of VHS is, is trying to get across, and if you like my idea of the parallel worlds showing up on the tapes thing. Um, and if you like these movies in general, let me know. If you don't like them, let me know. Whatever, just let me know something down below. If you like this video, hit that like button. Hit the subscribe button if you dig the channel. And if you think about it, go check out my Patreon page at patreon.com slash movietimelines. I, I'd appreciate it if you did. These guys, uh, these guys go there. They are my patrons, and they're pretty cool for doing so. I thank them for it, and I thank you for watching this video. And I'll see you very, very shortly for another one. Thanks a lot, guys. Bye-bye.